Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today uh, we're starting a new period. Um, and if you've yet to realize uh, the periods and um, their significances throughout a push, period one was from 1492 to 1607, obviously from the, the findings of the Americas, um, asterisk finding. Um, and to 1607, which was the first colony to survive, Jamestown. And it's from 1607 to 1754, the end of uh, salutary neglect. Who I said it right there. Um, and then you got um, the next one, 1754 to uh, 1788, right? Oh, I forgot. Um, it's, it's, Seven, uh, yeah, 754 is 1800, I think, uh, or 1796, it, it switches up. So this new period is 1800 to 1848. And the 1800 is a significance of the uh, election to, or the election of Thomas Jefferson to becoming our new president. And uh, to 1848, which is basically the end of the Mexican-American War, you could also say uh, the beginnings of conflict antebellum uh, before the Civil War. So um, let's get right into it. We have a lot of slides to cover. So I'm going to do my best to try and speed through this one. It, I feel like I'm going to keep saying this a lot. It was a long chapter. Each chapter is basically like, you know, 30 pages long. So I mean, I don't know why I keep saying it, but yeah. So chapter seven, the Jeffersonian era and is obviously symbolized by the election of Thomas Jefferson and his Democrat Republicans known as Jeffersonians who continue his um, policies as future president. So let's get into it. So we're gonna have a rise of cultural nationalism and Republicans favored education. They wanted to educate future voters to be, and those are known as the electorate. Um, and at the time, not all states had public education. Some had private colleges, private schools. Um, and as we've learned, women, it was mainly men who, you know, got an education. There were some women um, who, were educated but not as many and there's this idea of women getting more rights to get them educated because of this idea that pops up called republican motherhood where we uh the men back in the day wanted the women to have themselves become educated so that they can raise chil their children to become good citizens so there's idea of pushing forward women getting an education so they can pass down the knowledge they learn to their children to have them become part of this educated force to uh, go out and get an education, a degree, and become that educated electorate, all right? Um, as, and as we should know, slave owners did not want slaves to be educated because knowledge is power. And they feared that knowledge could encourage rebellion among slaves, and they did not want that because they had seen that in indentured servitude long ago in what rebellion? If you said Bacon's Rebellion, congrats. You are right. All right, so here's a mom with their children. Get them educated. Okay, uh, continuing on. Uh, University of Pennsylvania was the first medical school founded here in uh, the United States. Uh, and medical treatment was very, very, very primitive back then. Uh, you have this idea called bleeding. If someone was sick or, or not feeling well, they would go to the doctor and have them bleed. Uh, a, a loss of blood could, you know, help them recover. Yes, very primitive, very primitive. You have this uh, occupation of midwifery, midw midwives, which was a common occupation for women. Uh, to help um, pregnant mothers deliver uh, in childbirth. And there's a show on Netflix called, called The Midwife. 
I think. Um, it's about a show about midwives, but it's it's in England um, following World War II. Um, so there will be a decrease of midwifery in, in the beginnings of the United States um, because now physicians, doctors are performing deliveries. And you have um, a man named Noah Webster, uh, Webster's Dictionary, anyone? Uh, he created the American Spelling Book, 1783, and he helped standardize the English language for Americans. Yes. Thank you, Noah Webster. That's a picture of him. Probably trying to figure out the, um, the dealings of the... <laughs> his hair is all messed up because he's trying to figure out how the English language works. All right, so another... Now we're going to move on to religion, and there are two types of religions that are going to pop up during this time, um, you know, in regards to Protestants and uh, Baptists and all that. Uh, you're going to have deists who, or deism, where they believe in a God, but he created the universe and took a step back and let the universe, you know, take control that way. So deists believe that there is a God, but... Um, Everything else happened naturally. And then you have Unitarianism, kind of like, uh, it kind of sounds similar to utilitarianism. Um, but Unitarianists did not believe in predestination. So when you're born, you're already predestined, whether you're going to heaven or hell, and you can't fix that. No matter how many times you go to church, know how many times you pray, know how many times you volunteer and help the poor, help the sick. Unitarians believe anyone could attain salvation. Um, and that kind of, you know, it's, you could say it stems off from part of the enlightenment and they rejected the idea of the Trinity where the father, the son, and the Holy spirit are the same person. Uh, they believe Jesus was an actual person, a person of good, a person of good deeds and not the actual son of God. Whoa. Okay. Um, and so, Religion in the 18th century, only 10% of white Americans were members of a formal church. And would there be another attempt to bring them back? Of course, yes. So you're going to have something called the Second Great Awakening. That's why it's so big. I made it bigger. Uh, the Second Great Awakening is going to try and bring members back to churches. So you're going to have uh, the first big camp meeting in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801, where 25,000 people came to uh, hear about the good word. Uh, you're also going to have more uh, meetings in the Burned Over District, Western New York, Buffalo area. And then the message of the Second Great Awakening, which is basically the first message of the First Great Awakening, Individuals reconnecting with God, becoming more religious. And the effects of the Second Great Awakening, like the first, there's an increase in different sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects and uh, denominations. There's also an increase in, uh, there's an increase in involving women inside the church. And remember, that was one of the big, no nos of what was it, the pilgrims? Where, or was it, was it the Puritans? One of the P's, not allowing women to have the vote and not the vote, the rights within the church. Um, it wasn't Puritans. No, no. Yes, yes. Whatever. We got a long ways to go. Okay. And the Second Great Awakening actually helps inspire reform movements of the 1830s and 1840s later on. So, Second Great Awakening, almost as good as the first. Um, so, Cain Ridge, here's the spiritual awakenings in North America, camp meetings, getting converted, um, all that. So, some stirrings of industrialism. You have Samuel Slater. He's kind of known in American history as the father of the factory system. And this is during this is during the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Um, so he's going to come aboard a ship. He's going to come to the United States, and he's going to remember the uh, 
the ins and outs of how a factory worked in Europe, and he's going to build uh, his own, and they're going to sprout up all across uh, the Northeast. Um, you have Eli Whitney, who we should know about. Uh, he invented the cotton gin, cotton engine, uh, which drastically reduced the time needed to separate cotton from the seeds because picking cotton and picking the seeds out is a very arduous, dull task. Um, and it was designed to, at first, limit the expansion of slavery. However, it did have the opposite effect and it led to a huge explosion of slavery because now more and more cotton was, more and more people saw the need and see, saw how fast they could clean the cotton and sell the cotton and make the money off the cotton. So what do they do? They buy more land, they buy more slaves and the cycle just continues people. Um, again, that uh, it also helps the agricultural South connect with the textile North. So the textile North is where all the factories are, the cotton, gets sent to the north, it gets spun, it gets woven, it gets colored, it gets dyed, it gets sent to Europe. Um, he also helped invent the interchangeable parts where he said, you know, producing identical parts for weapons. So if like, you know, I'm gonna show a picture, I'll discuss it a little bit later. Uh, and it also was applied to other industries making individual individual parts for the machines. Um, and this example of a cookie cutter, uh, you have Robert Fulton upon the, uh, his boat, the Claremont sailed up the Hudson River. So going against the stream, against the, the force of the river. And that helped promote steamboat transportation because he applied the steam engine to boats. Samuel, Robert, Robert Fulton, I'm gonna say Samuel Fulton. So he has a cotton gin. You've seen this picture before. And interchangeable parts. So this is for like a weapon. So if you, so businesses, industries, factories are going to start building more and more of these parts. So say your gun loses, like you break your uh, the grip, uh, you can go down to the store and just replace your grip or whatever this is, the holster. Um, I don't know. I've never fired a gun. Uh, so this part, I'm just going to say this part. And you can replace it, interchangeable parts. And that's going to be applied to other industries, especially ones that run on machines. So if one breaks down, you can go to the local parts store and buy it. All right, so more industrializing. You have the idea of turnpikes. We kind of mentioned this last year. Uh, a famous one is the Lancaster Turnpike, 60 miles of road from Philly to Lancaster, and it's a toll road. And tur turnpikes made money for corporations, private companies trying to grow, and that's gonna spur the growth of other turnpikes. So you're paying other companies to use their road to get from one place to the other. Um, and I believe turnpikes are still a thing. They're obviously more back East. I know I um, experienced a turnpike when I was in like seventh or eighth grade and I uh, traveled to Pennsylvania. Uh, and we had to get on turnpike and we had to pay a toll to go on the highway. So that it's really weird. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Um, and state governments will also finance turnpikes into less populated areas connecting the country. There you go. This was the first major toll road built by a private company, Incorporated 792, by the state legislature, completed in two years later. And praised as the finest highway of its day, the stone and gravel turnpike stretched 62 miles. The 35th milestone out of Philadelphia was placed here. Early 20th century, the road was acquired by the state and became part of the transcontinental Lincoln Highway in U.S. 30. And if you want to know a little fun fact, okay, Jefferson as the president. We we're talking about what's go kind of going on in the background of society. So now. Jefferson as the president, he said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. So the revolution of 1800, is it, can, it, can it really be called a revolution as we learned last year in world history? Was it a drastic change? Mm, not really. Many of the Federalist policies remained intact except for the excise tax, because that excise tax, because that was uh, repealed, uh, you have this idea of patronage, 
where you provide government jobs to party members and supporters who are all about the Democrat Republican Party. Jefferson is going to know this and be known for using patronage, patronage in his second term, helping out those who help him. Okay, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. This is also going to be called the spoil system under future president Andrew Jackson. Uh, and obviously part of the platform of Jefferson's, Jeffersonians, Democrat Republicans, I'm going to start calling them Democrat Republicans, okay, was reducing the size of the federal government. So they wanted to cut back on the size of the military. And there was this fear kind of left, left from um, Washington, you know, this fear of large standing armies. So they wanted to reduce that. Um, and then there are these problems with the Barbary states, um, I believe in the Caribbean or, or Africa, where they are stealing and hijacking boats, ships. And so um, Jefferson has to raise an army to take care of these Barbary states. All right. Another big thing that happens, remember the last lecture led to a showdown. Here's the showdown. Marbury versus Madison, okay? The idea is Jefferson refused to allow Marbury, uh, a midnight judge appointed by Adams, remember, on one of the final days to serve. However, Marbury never got his appointment. And so he sued the Secretary of State, I believe, which was Madison. So it goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court stated that Marbury was entitled to be a judge, but they, the Supreme Court, could not enforce it. Uh, and this is where the idea of the Supreme Court um, can't really enforce the laws. That's part of the executive's job. So, uh, yes, he was entitled to be a judge, but they could not enforce it. The executive branch enforces the laws. So the Supreme Court deemed that the Judiciary Act of 1789 was actually unconstitutional to a degree uh, because there's nowhere in, in the act, in the law that says that the Supreme Court can force laws to happen. So they established this idea of judicial review. You need to know this, learn it, put it in your memory bank. This is so big, so big in American history. It deems the power of judicial review. And it happened so early on in the foundation of the United States that this is a big case. I can't state it. I can't state it more than that. And so now the Supreme Court can now declare federal laws constitutional or unconstitutional. And this is going to give the uh, judicial branch a lot of power under John Marshall. So John Marshall is the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court justice here. Um, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Marbury versus Madison, 1803. So more things that happened under uh, the president, two key judges. Again, I said, John Marshall, chief justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and he's going to increase the power of the federal government. Um, Samuel Chase, lesser known, but just as important, he was a justice on the Supreme Court, and he would be impeached. Now, we know what impeachment means, um, but that's also to bring charges against because he was a federalist, all right? He was not... He was one of Washington and Adams boys, okay? And he would not be removed from office. So the, the, the lesson of impeachment from Chase, um, from his corruption, um, people would not use impeachment as regularly, regularly as they wanted, making it only significant for the high crimes uh, to be brought against um, future um, future problems in America. And it usually happens within the, the court system. Um, lesser known, obviously we know the presidents um, and that's where, impe but impeachment is more for the corruption of judges and all that. So other judges do get removed. And this is um, Samuel Chase. I forgot his name. I just read it. Okay. Doubling the national domain. Uh, you have the Treaty of Il Defonso, uh, 1800, and France regained uh, back the, from the Spanish the Louisiana Territory that was once theirs, then given to Spain and got it back from Spain. And the U.S., of course, wanted the Port of New Orleans. Uh, they have the right of deposit. They have all their goods in New Orleans. So 
Jefferson sends diplomats Livingston and Moreau to buy the LA Louisiana purchase for 15 million. He wanted to buy the port of New Orleans from Napoleon, and then they end up spending $15 million to buy all the land. Uh, and this idea, what happened is, was this purchase actually constitutional? And, you know, Jefferson is a strict interpretation, strict constructionist of the Constitution and his values at the beginning of his presidency. So at the beginning, no. But Jefferson argued his treaty-making power allowed him to make this purchase of land between uh, foreign nations. So Louisiana Purchase caused Jefferson to switch from a strict interpretation to a loose interpretation from the uh, necessary proper clause. And then you have, ironically, the Federalists would loot, uh, were against loose interpretation, which is, again, ironic because the Federalists believe that um, the Constitution should be interpreted as is. So the, the fear of new land would be made up of Jeffersonian farmers, and that would limit uh, Federalist powers. They feared that doubling the size of the United States at this time, it would just be filled with uh, Democrat, Republicans, farming, and Jeffersonian ideals being um, introduced and sticking there, and the Federalists would fail and fade away, in which they kind of do. Again, this is Louisiana Purchase. We're going to do a map on that quickly. Uh, so the, you have the Essex Junto, or Junto, even though it's not in Spanish. Uh, some New England Federalists wanted to secede, ooh, ooh, and they tried to attempt Aaron Burr to it, and it's not going to go well. Aaron Burr declines. Uh, and as we've kind of discussed a little bit of Aaron Burr, sir, um, he killed uh, Alexander Hamilton in a duel as, you know, Burr and Hamilton disliked each other heavily. And um, Hamilton helped Burr again. This is why they did it, help keep Burr from becoming the governor of New York. And Burr will travel to the Southwest United States, try to take over land from the Spanish. Less known. Spoiler, if you haven't seen Hamilton on Netflix, or was it Disney? I don't know, whatever. Uh, expansion and war. Uh, so we're gonna zoom, zoom to a little more future ahead. Uh, you have the Berlin Decree where France uh, forbade European trade with Great Britain, and they would capture US, US ships that traded. Uh, and you have the orders in council where all goods being traded with Europe must stop at Great Britain first. So again, Britain and France trying to go at each other. All right, and I believe that's also the continental system around this time of Napoleon. Uh, and um, both of these violated the US's rights to, to trade with whomever they want to and neutrality. And there's this idea of impressment, okay? No impressment, okay? It's not like you trying to impress a girl, all right? Or a boy or whoever you choose. Um, but the British impressment is the policy of searching US ships for deserters and forcing them to be men in the British Navy, okay? So wrong, so totally wrong. Uh, and they could take anyone aboard a ship, call them a deserter, and put them in their army, okay? This idea of impressment. And so the Chesapeake Leopard affair is going to deal with impressment. And it was a British ship that was attacked, attacked a U.S. ship, killing three and wounding 18. And that leads to... Okay, um, impressment taking from one ship to the other, going upon the British, and here's the Leopard affair. It's gonna lead to um, the US to make some things happen because impressment is happening fairly rapidly uh, along the Atlantic Sea, Atlantic Ocean. You have the Embargo Act of 1807 which prevented American trade to all foreign countries. And that's gonna become a huge disaster. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, not trading with other countries. So you're kind of losing money. 
You also have this non-intercourse act because that's in um, response to the embargo act where it reopened trade except to France and England. Again, still, this can still be a disaster, all right? Um, and then you have McCann's bill, Mikan's bill, uh, number two, because uh, number one wasn't passed in the House. And Mikan's bill means uh, the promise to end embargo against a country that will respect America's rights. France agreed to it. Britain didn't. So the embargo remained against the British. Oh, man. So much, so much fun times. Here's a political cartoon. Damn it, how he nicks them. Okay, and this says, oh, the cursed Ograbame. But if you read this backwards, it says embargo. More. So General William Henry Harrison would become governor of the Indiana Territory. And you have a Native American leader named Tecumseh, who was a fairly strong leader among all the, uh, among his tribe and the local tribes around him. And he sought to unite all Native Americans against the uh, against the American government. And there's this battle of Tippecanoe, where William Henry Harrison defeats the Native Americans. Britain aided and encouraged this uprising. Uh, that's going to result in increased American expansion, obviously, to Indiana and to the West. William Henry, William Henry Harrison and Tecumseh. Okay, this is going to lead to the War of 1812 between the British and the U.S. Okay, and you're going to have these group of guys called Warhawks, which were young congressmen, mainly from the South and the West territories. The favored war against Great Britain, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun. Oh, I, I messed up. Uh, and a must-know battle is uh, from the War of 1812 is obviously the Battle of New Orleans, uh, where Jackson, Andrew Jackson, becomes a hero. And this occurs after the war ended. Um, but the Battle of New Orleans was won by the by the U.S. The Treaty of Ghent ends the War of 1812. Again, not going to go much into detail about war history. Uh, what battle led to what battle to this battle? Okay, New, Battle of New Orleans need to know. Um, and the Treaty of Ghent ends it. Neither side gained or lost anything. So it's just a big old waste of money, in my opinion. Okay, that's Henry Clay and that's John C. Calhoun. I put William Henry Harrison. Ugh, can't can't forgive myself. Okay, so the War of 1812 is also going to lead to the Hartford Convention, where uh, New England Federalists had many of those grievances where they wanted to see, they wanted an amendment, increased requirement to declare war. Some will urge secession. And this is actually going to be the downfall. The Hartford Convention is the downfall of the Federalist Party since the country was experiencing this high sense of nationalism, you know, love for one's country. And, you know, they just kind of took the port of New Orleans. They took over the city and they kind of won. Uh, and they just bought, you know, this Louisiana purchase. They got all this land, all this expansion. Uh, it's high times, okay? Don't secede. That's just wrong. So the Federalist Party, bye-bye. And that is the end of the lecture. Bye-bye is right. Bye-bye to the Federalist Party and bye-bye to this lecture. Uh, so hopefully you guys did enjoy that. If you did, uh, smash that like button. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.